Chris, great to get you back on Real Vision. It's been a while. I don't think you and I have actually sat down and talked on Real Vision before. No, sir, but thank you for having me. Listen, you know, we've got to know each other over, over the recent times, and I'm just finding it fascinating where this whole kind of asset management industry is starting to go, right? So just for people who haven't seen you before, talk about a little bit about your background and what you guys are doing, and then we'll just dig in a bit. Sure. My background's more on the TA and trader side, started in 06 at Morgan Stanley, and then broke out after the financial crisis to form our own fund in 2010. And we ran a vol art fund all the way up until switching over full bore crypto in 2018. Uh, but my side is, is mainly on the systematic allocations. I had to teach myself code and design various you know, trend following. How do you teach an old dog like you code? <laughs> well, I'm not yet 40, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, it's actually, that's a really good point you bring up because I think my team's super unique and it includes rock stars like Han Bodak, Rishi Narang, Kamal Mokadam. I'm, I'm the, the humble servant of, of the big guys. Um, but I think our, our guys, we, we blend, we're just old enough to have gone through that transition from ticket writing, which I even did back in my day. And, and you were at Goldman, you know, when Heim was there, and, transitioning to the, the electronic and then the high frequency and all that, that, that arms race. I think our generation, call it 35 to 50, right, has a unique experience in space, in asset management in general and in trading in general, that likely will never be matched before in, in time, right? No, none of the kids younger than me will ever know what it's like to open outcry, right, on, on S&P futures or, or be at an actual trade desk. Like Morgan had a giant desk in, in White Plains, right? Uh, and UBS had a giant desk in Stanford, and, and, you, and you know what I'm speaking of. But now you have, you know, very few equity traders on desks or bond traders on desks, and it, it's just an experience where I think the value add of the real, real time risk management and desk trading on top of the tech end, whether it be CS or algorithmic or, or machine learning, that hybrid experience that we've had, I think, is really why we we have a nice balanced offering here that we first built for ourselves, but now is scalable and, and repeatable. I would say. So why move from Volab into crypto? They sound like different things. <laughs> um, well, not yes and no. I, you know, it's a loaded question. Uh, in VIX trading during this uh, last decade, that's if you want to be long vol, you're basically teeing up money to get smashed. Uh, we, we luckily ended up positive more than negative, but it just was kind of a losing effort out the gate to be hedging constantly for the types of uh, portfolios we're hedging and, and people allocate to vol funds not to have that negative convexity, but they want the positive convexity. And just doing that from 2010, really between then and 2017 was really difficult. You had the VIX drop all the way under 10. Um, so that vol trading though really gets us excited about crypto because with a, you know, what was a 90 vol, now it's a 55 vol on BTC. That's very exciting. Uh, a lot of alpha there, a lot of risk management techniques you can use to extract, you know, whatever thesis you have. So you were so. When did you start the business or the fund? When did you start this whole thing, and how did you go about kind of constructing it? Because there's no, well, you were relatively early, and there was no tools in place to do any of this. So talk me through that whole thing. When did you start? So we, you know, Haim and myself and our, our team, we we first were doing, you know, we were doing the basis arms ETN over futures within the ball log structure. Um, doing some create redeem stuff in ETFs. So, so just some basic stuff that had made us a little bit of money. We had invested in a Bitcoin ATM company early on as kind of a first PE type VC investor. Which year that, was this we're talking? This is this is you know, early 2017, kind of before it, it exploded. Um, we started looking for a manager or managers right in the you know, Q, Q2 of 2017 going, all right, this, this, I, we can see on the chart. We don't know much about it read the white paper, got passionately involved in the theoretical and the esoteric, you know, psychological benefits of, oh, I can be my own bank and uh, the, the distributed ledger technology. But we knew what we weren't good at, which was crypto analytics. And um, we hunted a few managers and did our due diligence. And we're just like, you know what? No one we're talking to is doing it the way that we would do it. So but mid, mid 2017, we started designing uh, software to trade it. Uh, creating our own order book. We aggregated at that time six exchanges, five coins, and created basically our own NBBO. And we would do all NBB, the NBBO? National bets, bid, and offer. Old school term. Ah. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
because you know we wanted to have a midpoint price, right? Because yep. at that time you had very real tech access difficulties because you had REST APIs; those were unstable, and really it was a it was a cluster f to put together. Very manual. Even the signals were gray box. We had models on Bloomberg terminal. We had a, a very robust kind of viewpoint that that Heim built with aggregating all the pipes. And then we had buttons to press, very video game esque green for a go, red for a sell. Um, but once we we figured that we had the tools to actually trade effectively ish, then we spun up the fund in, in 2018. Um, we we funded it large large scale. Our money. We're still 40 percent of our AUM today. So you set up a crypto fund that's trading on algo models in 2018, and the market's now plummets like a stone. How do you get on? Well, thank God we, you know, as as Heim put it, we had ARB you could drive a bus through. So we did that mean reversion trading, and that gave us a hell of a PL for 2018. And, and very, very honestly, we would make 300 bips in a day and call it a day. Um, because you could basically just go back and forth between the major venues at the time, buying against Bitfinex, Bitstamp, et cetera, um, and just know when when to transact. If you Did you take any directional risk at that point? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I would say roughly 25% was just buying the traditional oversold signals on a, on a daily basis and then selling the overbought, just old school mean version. And we just combined that with the arbitrage. And that and that worked in the crypto winter? It did. Fascinating. We, we had a lot of fun. And, and what, where it wasn't very fun was when it compressed into that triangle before dumping into December 18. Yeah, that was a scary time. Yeah, and it was difficult because the ranges had a lot of false breakouts. This was, I think, was the tether break point. Correct. That was when Bitfinex had mm -hmm. not funded themselves. That was what was going on there, and then the break. Yep. And so that was like, all right, we're not getting caught just being a one-trick pony. That was really impetus. All right, we've got a lot, a little bit of attention to, to pad uh, some investors in for Q1 2019. Let, let's diversify this into what we want it to be. Um, at that time, we didn't have any, you know, exchange uh, fees that were discounted for hedge funds. It was it was huge for what we're paying. So we got into doing market making and, and sort of tagged on additional strategies that were value add to the portfolio itself that we knew we wanted to get to because we've seen this before as as you have going, you know, whether whether falling rent tech or Citadel or Two Sigma, those those guys have really laid out how you do it properly. Um, and that's, that takes us all the way to here, where we're now we have 11 systematic strategies going, we're staking, running master nodes, and really have kind of an all weather. And that's system. all in one fund, or does it separate into different strategies, or it's just one? It is just one fund. You know, we're, we're very- 11 different strategies going in one fund. That's just on the algo side. Um, there's more strategies than 11, but you know, we, we need to solve for intraday vol, and then need to have two week to, to four week time horizons on the longer duration stuff. Um, so then what does that do to the volatility of the fund itself? Have you dampened volatility but kept return? How has it kind of worked by adding all of this? Uh, of course, as soon as you get fancier, you, you, you give up some of the beta, right? Um, so I think the way we look at it is, is obviously through Sharp. We also want to calculate the, the daily against MVAR, like what, what's our actual modified value at risk? Because if that is decaying or the attributes of the risk reward profile isn't what we're looking for, then we got to we got to retool it. Um, so here, here we're really looking to play offense and defense simultaneously. And we've had a few periods, even even the most recent month to date, where there, there's outperformance more often on the down than the up. Because um, nothing we've designed really can grab, you know, anything these you know DeFi or NFTs are doing. So hey, if you like this clip, be sure to like and subscribe for more crypto related content. Also, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on RealVision.com slash crypto.